Um, now, folks, good morning. I'd like to introduce our guest today. We're joined by Dr. Jenny Liu, who is an English professor at Pierce College and the recent recipient of a Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center Research Fellowship. Jenny has a, B a biology BS, a creative writing MFA, and a literature of science PhD from the University of California, Irvine, and is continuing to culminate her environmental knowledge by pursuing a master's in marine affairs from the University of Washington on a part-time basis. So thank you for being with us. We see how busy you are, uh, Dr. Liu. So it's, it's fantastic that you're here. Her teaching and research focus on the intersections of climate change, environmental justice, and how the ways that we think, talk, and write about nature shape both our human cultures and the natural world. Jenny's current projects include a book-length collection of poems, which is forthcoming from Kaya Press, the University of South Southern California's diasporic Asian American Press, a book of essays related to the High Country news piece centered in today's conversation, and various ecological projects related to multidisciplinary river restoration modeling that is durable to climate change. And those of you who, and I hope it was everybody, who read Dr. Liu's piece that was included for seminar today a quote from there that I thought would introduce her talk really well was this. She says, quote, I came home worried that my father's field of chrysanthemum would invade the last traces of native prairie on our ridge. And I demanded that he replace his Chinese vegetables with native plants. I don't remember if he did. I do know that as a budding ecologist, it never occurred to me that my environmental enlightenment was displacing my father's heritage, which was also my own, unquote. And that's in that high country news piece that she entitled, Am I Uninvasive Species? How COVID-19 and Murder Hornets Compelled a Writer to Rethink Invasions. Please, community, join me in welcoming Dr. Jenny Liu. Dr. Liu, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate your time and all your beautiful knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here to talk about all of this with, with you today. Um, I want to start by admitting to all of you that I was actually really nervous to join you today. And I think the reason for that is because this is an article that cuts really close to the quick for me. Um, I think it's things that had been sort of brewing in my subconsciousness probably for decades that I had never really found a way to write about. And then all of a sudden <laughs> this ring, the, uh, you know, these, this constellation of ideas suddenly gelled for me. And I was like, okay, it's time. I'm going to write this article. Um, but it's not an article that recommends answers or that contains any sort of wisdom or solutions. I, I guess I see this more as an article that enacts a problem or a paradox that I don't really know how to fix. Um, I don't even really know how to explain. And maybe a good part of my anxiety here today comes from the fact that usually when I wanna talk about something, um, at the risk of uh, disrupting everyone around me, I'll just, I'll talk to myself, sometimes for days, uh, just kind of winnowing away at what it is that I want to say until I get down to the sort of heart of the issue. And in this case, which I think mirrors the process of, of creating the essay all of, that all of you read, um, every time I tried to talk about this, something different came out of my mouth. So I made myself a list of things I really uh, think it's important to bring up as all of us converse today. Um, so I'll try to just sort of like, you know, wrench myself back to that list, but there's a part of me that doesn't really know which parts of this conversation are going to come to the fore today, because this is an essay that I think came from several very deeply seated parts of my identity, um, which are not always in agreement with each other. Um, I'm hoping that this rings true for many of you. 
as well. Um, and I'm hoping that the writing process behind this and the idea of using writing as a way to sort of grapple with some of our deepest contradictions as opposed to writing as a way to kind of like share things that we know and, and we're certain we believe. Um, I'm hoping this methodology is something that rings true with all of you and something that applies to the way that we think and talk to each other like far beyond the written page. So one of the paradoxes at the heart of this essay is a contradiction between two aspects of my training as a teacher and researcher and scholar, um, which is to say that it's a contradiction between the way of thinking that I was trained as an ecologist and the way of thinking that I was trained in as an anti-racist practitioner in the humanities. Um, I don't think that we have a good way of reconciling these differences, right? Where, you know, I think the article deals with the problem of what it means to be native to somewhere and what it means to be an invader. And within ecological paradigms, invasion is one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss. It's one of the leading causes of species destruction. And we can look at case study after case study of plants that come, in, that come in from somewhere else, out competing native plants and uh, leading to unintentional consequences. Um, this is a well-accepted ecological paradigm. And yet I hope that, that many of you, like me, hear some problematic echoes there when we think about how this might apply to human cultures and the idea that invasive populations could come in and outcompete natives. Um, how do we reconcile those two things? <laughs> I don't know how we reconcile those two things. And I think that that's really the sort of heart of the essay and the problem that we could talk around in so many different ways. So choosing a path through that problem has sort of been <laughs> my challenge for today. Um, and I'm hoping we all recognize whatever path we forge today as only one path amongst many. Um, and I hope that, I hope that this can just be one example of how we can begin to recognize the latent white supremacist norms that oftentimes underlie our thinking, uh, even when we are attempting to sort of be anti-racist, even when we're attempting to participate in these endeavors that we understand as sort of fundamentally good for our community. Um, and I think we're left with a big question here of like, what do we do with these conceptual ghosts? What do we do with these linguistic ghosts? And how do we talk about these complex issues in a way that doesn't do harm to the very populations that we're trying to serve? Um, so another source of my worry and anxiety as I worked through this essay and as I, as I submitted it for publication was that I knew it was gonna fly in the face of what many of my closest friends and mentors had taught me. I knew I could picture the faces of the people who would be hurt by what I had to say or who would feel that I was implying that they were a white supremacist. And I dreaded some of the conversations that I knew were going to follow the publication of this essay. Um, what I hadn't really been expecting was the sort of huge public response from people I had never met before um, who specialized in invasive species or maybe they were fish geneticists um, who all had very emphatic things to say about um, my suggestion that we rethink nativeness. And let me say, I'm not the only person who has suggested this. Um, but apparently I got to the quick in a way that has led to my last six months just being full of thoughts like I'm not an ichthyologist like I don't know to, uh, like I don't know how to advise people on um, on bull trout conservation. Um, but I do know that it's led to me spending these last six months thinking very long and hard 
about the stories that we tell ourselves about nature and expanding this topic into the way that we think about our own identities. Um, I've realized that the stories I tell myself about nature come from, I suppose, my own sort of bifurcated identity, right? Like, let me, I think the best way to do this is just to, to tell you a little bit about my family's history and how it led me to the conflicts um, that made their way into this piece. Um, and as I do this, I hope that I'm just not telling you all about my family's history, <laughs> um, but that I'm inviting you to think of your own parallel stories and the parallel ways in which your relationships to nature and to storytelling are fragmented and challenged and enriched by, uh, by your own identities. Um, so on my father's side, I'm, I'm Chinese, so I'm half Chinese. My father came from a well-to-do nationalist Chinese family. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, um, his, his grandpa uh, turned against, I think, I believe, I believe my grandpa has like eight brothers who fought in the communist military and my grandpa fought against them and then fled uh, with Chiang Kai-shek to Taiwan. So my family sort of abandoned their position of relative comfort uh, and became immigrants uh, or refugees uh, in Taiwan. And then my dad eventually um, came to the United States for graduate school. And he's an engineering professor now um, at the University of Idaho. So I grew up in rural Idaho in a community that was almost entirely white where um, I think, you know, the, a life in nature is kind of written into that world. I grew up in the country, like on a little mountain outside of town um, and a life as being sort of marked by, <laughs> I suppose, a racial otherness um, also came along with that. You know, I think in many ways we're fortunate in our location here in the Puget Sound area um, to be surrounded by people who uh, experience diversity in ways and experience sort of, uh, you know, complex cultural legacies in ways that um, allow us to relate to each other in a way that was completely absent from my upbringing. So my immigrant heritage runs down only one side of my family, but the experience was dramatic. Like my experience growing up was being not white in a white culture my experience in the out of doors was being chased away from trailheads by trucks uh, flying Confederate flags, uh, being, uh, yeah, I remember stopping for supplies in a town and having one of the locals tell me I had to leave because I looked too much like the faces he had shot at in Korea. Um, I remember taking, actually, I used to, I used to teach at Northwest Indian College in uh, relatively rural Idaho, and it was on a, um, on a, on a backcountry trip with some of my students, and we came out, and we tried to go to a cafe, and, uh, and they refused to serve us because everyone, myself included, was conspicuously not white in a white town, um, so I've had to think long and hard, and I suppose I've had a lifetime to reflect on what it means to venture into nature as someone who is not white, what it means to be a steward of nature um, within a culture where the very definition of stewardship is embedded in white norms and where those white norms are problematic, right? The way that we have um, treated wardship with relationship to minorities in America has been a really big deal. I know um, in your discussion on immigration, you talked a little bit about the Dawes Act a few weeks ago. And one of the central premises of the Dawes Act, well, <laughs> it's a big and a legally complex issue, but one of the central problems with the Dawes Act was that it assumed that Native Americans could not own land and make decisions about their own land. They needed to be under federal wardship, um, 
which is to say the federal government controlled the land when it was technically owned by indigenous owners. Um, and then <laughs> this basically resulted in the federal government kind of paving a way to steal vast tracts of land from indigenous owners. Um, so it becomes, we could talk about that more in detail later um, if it comes up. Um, but I think the part that matters here is this idea that we think of our relationship to the land in general ecological terms as one of stewardship. But when we think about how that applies to indigenous communities or other communities of color, that becomes condescending and problematic and frequently a ruse that was used to exploit those communities. I think it's something that applies to my own Asian American communities as well. So we ask ourselves, well, what on earth should our relationship to nature be when everything that we've learned about how to care for nature has these racist ghosts? Um, how do we deal with that? Uh, what can we construct in its stead? Um, I don't know if I have any answers to this question. I just have more questions about this question. And I'm hoping I can share some of those questions with you today. And then maybe we can discuss uh, some of your shared experiences and maybe work towards some answers together. Um, so this is a question that takes many forms. I wanna walk you through some of the weirdness of making the essay that you read for today. I had this idea, I was actually sitting in a climate science research meeting and one of my indigenous collaborators uh, was talking offhandedly before the meeting began about how COVID-19 had interrupted his relationship to nature and interrupted his relationships to his community. Um, he was stuck in his house, his kids were going into, into college. He was telling me, I specifically remember because it's just something about the phrase stood out to, it caught my poet's ear, I suppose. Um, telling me about like uh, trying to isolate in his house and not being able to go out and monitor the salmon, even though it was the time of year when he would normally be counting the salmon and how he was having to rely on uh, attempting to hear the sound of salmon in the waterfalls and the way that the sound of the water was different um, when fish were ascending the falls versus when they were empty. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I grew up in the wilderness. I've been backpacking alone. Like since I was a teenager, I've like worked every possible job that got me back out into the, it got me out into the back country, like ever since I was a kid. And I don't have that relationship to nature. I can't imagine, you know, I've spent many an hour working as a wildlife biologist, like snorkeling and counting fish and identifying fish and electrofishing. And I, can't, I don't know what, what fish in a waterfall sound like. I, that's a connection I don't have. I'll probably never have. Um, COVID-19 has not changed my relationship to my family at least on my dad's side, they live a continent away. I see them intermittently, like a handful of summers in my entire life, actually. Um, one of my aunts and one of my uncles have, have passed away in the past year or so while we've been um, stuck, in, <laughs> stuck in our country due to COVID. Um, I haven't, you know, I didn't, I didn't attend their funerals. I speak Chinese sparsely and poorly and can hardly communicate with my family members about our loss. Um, I've watched my dad like isolated on his mountain in rural Idaho, just um, kind of shutting off. He's the, he's the oldest sibling. So he's he's watching his, his brothers and sisters die. And he's convinced that he's not going to outlive COVID. Um, he's convinced that he shouldn't outlive COVID and he's convinced that he's failed his family because COVID has prevented him from um, being there to even say goodbye to his siblings. Um, so my experience of COVID has been a confirmation of the isolation that my family already felt. And this was thrown into high relief by listening to my colleague talk about sort of rich and connected culture that COVID had disrupted for him. 
um, around the same time, you know, in the same meeting, because there's a group of scientists all, all uh, chatting together. We were talking about the murder hornets, the uh, Vespa mandarinia, which had recently, and there's almost no other terms to describe it within the ecological lexicon, which had invaded North America through Seattle. Um, and started thinking about how that served as a partial metaphor for what it meant to be Asian in America right now, and how that also sort of served as a way to let off steam or a scapegoat or a straw man in some way where we all recognize that we shouldn't be thinking or saying these racist things about Asian Americans. Um, and yet this introduction of an Asian wasp gave us a way to channel those fears into conversations about hunting down the wasps and destroying them and the way that Asian invasiveness was, just, was um, threatening America. All of the things that we couldn't say about people, we could say with impunity when it came to talking about ecology. Um, so those are the two pieces that kind of went into this essay, right? Like, what does it mean to be so disconnected from your from the land and from your culture because of your complex immigrant past. Um, and what does it mean to be disconnected from what people are saying about you and what you might even be saying or thinking about yourself um, by this weird set of partial and shifting metaphors so that you felt that people were threatening to murder you and yet it was always through metaphor and never in a way that you could call out as an explicit threat. It's almost an out of body experience, I think, sort of finding that you're part immigrant, you are partially targeted, you are partially indignant, and yet there's nothing you can grasp onto. Um, so I think that sort of inability to grasp onto anything is at the heart of the essay that you read. Um, or maybe I should say the inability to grasp onto anything except stories, like the stories that your family tells, the stories that you tell yourself about nature. And the weird thing about this story was that I thought I had this great idea and I like in that meeting, I remember texting one of the other people in the meeting, like, I just had this idea for an essay, I'm submitting it to High Country News right now. And everyone was kind of like, what? <laughs> like, you're not a journalist, are you? And I was like, it's perfect, they'll, they'll take it. I'm doing it right now. So I just logged out of the meeting, wrote the pitch to High Country News. Um, they told me they were interested, but they asked for a 1400 word essay that utilized a clear metaphor and gave their readers an easily packageable message about man's relationship to nature. And because I was like, I want my essay published in high country news, I've, I've, I love reading that. It's a publication I've read uh, you know, since I was a college student. Um, and I just felt so excited about the possibility that my work could be in its pages. So I was like, yes, I can do it. And then I sat down to write the essay and I was like, can't. <laughs> There's no way on earth I could do that. And I went through all of the sort of layers of doubt. I can't do this because I'm not a journalist. I mean, the weird thing is I was a radio journalist for many years long ago, but in my life today, I am like half poet, half scientific writer, and this just felt unsurmountable. I thought I somehow lacked the skills to make it happen. Um, after working through all of those layers of self-doubt, I started to realize like, I can't do this because the story I'm trying to tell doesn't fit into the shape that they've asked me to make it into. And then I started thinking about it some more and I was like, well, the story doesn't fit into the shape that they've asked me to fit it into. Um, not because there's something idiosyncratic about my story, but because I have this sort of double consciousness that I cannot possibly fit into the simplistic framework that they've asked me to create. So I've told you about the immigrant side of my family, about my family's sort of fall from grace. My grandpa, when he fled with the nationalists, made my father, the oldest son, take an oath that he would never contact anyone else in the family who had stayed in communist China. And my dad is the eldest son has enforced that. Like I'm the eldest child of my generation. I'm not sure it entirely matters in that paradigm since I'm a woman, um, but my father has made me and my son and uh, 
my brother and my brother's children and every other member of the family, however young, however distance from this history, like all promise uh, that we'll never, um, we'll never try to find our family. Like our narrative is, it's just us. We're cut off from the rest of that. Um, my grandpa and his brother were all fighter pilots and they all like actively tried to shoot each other out of the sky. Um, that's, that's, that's the narrative we grew up with on that side. Um, my dad is blind in one eye um, because he had an eye infection that wasn't treated as a child. He recently had to have several abdominal surgeries because he had a hernia that was never treated as a child because his family had no money. They were starving. Um, he's the eldest child. I think I mentioned his older siblings were born when the family had regained some level of comfort in Taiwan. He's like a full six inches shorter than any of his siblings, like likely due to malnutrition. Um, part of the gap between him and his other siblings is that um, his brother, his brother died, two of his brothers, before the recent sort of spate of deaths, two of his brothers died from just extreme lack of medical care um, during his family's early days in Taiwan. So when my father came to the US, it was to escape that life endangering poverty. And when he came to the US, he came to the US like still in the grips of that poverty and facing the intense discrimination that Asian Americans who come to America looking to make their life better tend to feel, um, sort of made worse by the fact that he came here with an education and he came here to finish his education and to become a professor. So it was a combination of intense poverty paired with aspirations that were understood by the white communities that surrounded him like as a threat. Um, so I've grown up, as I mentioned before, in white communities where I felt that threat in a way that I might not have if I had grown up in, a, in more multicultural surroundings. I've also grown up close to a father whose sort of immigrant trauma is at the very core of our family's experience. But on the other side of my family, like I come from a long line of Pennsylvania coal miners, a long line of Pennsylvania coal miners who believe that immigrants are ruining America, who believe that people like me shouldn't be here a long line of Pennsylvania coal miners who disowned my mother when she married my father with the result that I don't know that side of my family either between having like, I've met my grandparents a few times and my mom has told me a few stories about, about uh, her relatives. And my parents, this is kind of a cute story, but they met in perhaps the most stereotypically Asian way possible, uh, which is that my mom was walking home from work. She was a lifeguard. So the pool closed pretty late at night. She was walking home. Um, some people uh, jumped her like in the street as she was walking home. My dad happened to be leaving the swimming pool. He's an avid lap swimmer. And he beat up my mom's attackers with his Kung Fu because he's been a Kung Fu practitioner since childhood. Um, and I guess that was love at first sight. And so my mom defied her family, uh, defied her racist upbringing, married my father. And, you know, my brother and I lived in the sort of isolation of sort of immigrant trauma on one hand and this sort of complex and swirling like uh, racist legacy on the other hand, um, which means that I kind of came to this topic with a double consciousness, both as an immigrant sort of affected by white supremacy, but also with the understanding that the other half of my blood was <laughs> probably was white supremacist blood. Like I'm an immigrant, but also a settler. In, a, in, in terms of my ancestry. And that makes it really complicated to talk about how we have been harmed and who's harming us and what our role in setting, in setting those damages to rights should be. Um, 
think maybe that is another part of the anxiety I feel even talking with with all of you about immigration today, because just as part of me responded to sort of feedback from this article by like, I'm not an ichthyologist, I can't tell you what to do about your fish. There's a part of me that says like, I'm not sure that I'm an immigrant and I'm not sure what right I have to speak for the communities who have been harmed or displaced um, by the kinds of latent white supremacy that I discuss in the article. Um, and yet the other hand is, you know, <laughs> the other hand, the other hand, the other hand, we swirl forever here, right? The other hand is the reality that sort of I have been harmed <laughs> by these interactions. I've had guns pointed at me. I've been driven out of the woods. I've had people say like completely unexpected and, and uh, racially inflected things to me. Um, more out in nature than anywhere else in my life. I don't know if it's because of the isolation that leads people to sort of think that they can say things they wouldn't say in front of an audience. I don't know if it's because something about the way that Americans conceive of nature is inextricably tied up with ideas about sort of white purity um, and sort of brown otherness in which in the same way that exotic species don't belong in American landscapes, exotic people don't belong there either. Um, but I do know that it's made writing this article sort of one of the most, I think, challenging and rewarding pieces of writing sort of that I've done in my life. Um, one of the most exciting things about it is the opportunity to talk about these challenges with people like all of you. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to think about, I guess what I've started to think of as narrative dysfunction, right? Like, America has a lot of stories that we tell ourselves about nature, a lot of stories we tell ourselves about race, a lot of stories we tell ourselves about like what it means to be an immigrant. And when I come to this and I'm like, I cannot fit my story about nature into the story that I'm supposed to be telling. I can't fit my story about being an immigrant into the stories that I feel like I'm supposed to be telling um, with the result that I don't feel like I belong in nature, even though I have worked as a field biologist for my entire adult life, and I've spent my entire life like in the mountains and in the woods. Um, I don't feel like an immigrant, even though I've spent my summers, which is to say I don't feel like I can claim any real dimension of the harm that is wrought upon immigrants, despite the fact that I spent my life sort of shouldering um, uh, acts, of, acts of racialized aggression, despite the fact that I've been cut off from my family my entire life, that all I know of them is sort of a few summers um, in Taiwan when I was a child. Um, despite the fact that quite honestly, sort of my sort of continued engagement with environmental science has been sort of riddled with racist assumptions and racist interactions with people who are well-meaning environmental professionals who nevertheless come from a place of tacit white understanding um, in which people like me have no place in nature or in the practice of environmental science. Um, so I think I want to leave off here with this idea that it becomes very difficult for us to tell stories about who we are and where our families come from and how those family and how those family pasts um, shape our relationships with the natural world. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for your thoughts here. I'm hoping to hear some of your stories and I'm hoping that we can uh, begin to get into that difficult question of what our stories even ought to look like uh, when we have so many voices coming from within our own heads. All right. Um, Anthony, is this a good place to sort of uh, leave off and, uh, and to um, bring the community into the conversation? I think so. First, let me just thank you for sharing with us a complex layered set of issues that you've put before us in a way that allows us to think about all the way these different forces, social, cultural, political, and economic among others collide. And I, I, yes, I wanna invite our learning community in. If folks have 
questions, please send them to me directly in the chat. Raise your hand. I'll call on you, then Trey will unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. We'll do the give back the same way. Just contact me directly. So if you, if folks out there have questions or thoughts that they wanna share, um, please let's have some dialogue, put that work in the chat for me. Um, but, but I'll begin Dr. Liu and just again, add on to my thank you in thinking through the ways these issues manifest themselves in so many aspects of our lives and that they're not easy and they don't have because of the history of white supremacy, um, settler colonialism, patriarchy and the various other ways in which people are oppressed and exploited on these lands that it's not an easy not to untie and understand um, except through having dialogue with each other um, because one of the things that you're also doing for us is helping us see the many faces of white supremacy in these lands and the way, many ways in which they interact with um, our understanding of the operation of white supremacy and its ongoing denial. We see the many ways in which it gets denied and then reinforced. And this cycle of denial and reinforcement um, is part of the ways in which white supremacy continues to defend and extend itself. So I, I'm wondering if you could talk more about that intersection of settler colonialism, that Europeans came to this land, took the land, took slaves, brought them over to work the land. If you could talk about that history of settler colonialism and its complexities with immigration a little bit more that in any of the stories that you were offering to tell before, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, so I think my sort of immersion into settler colonial trauma was sort of dramatic and unconventional because it's something that I hadn't thought about in a lot of detail during my own sort of intellectual upbringing, right? Like I uh, explicitly chose UC Irvine because it was more than 50% Asian. And after growing up in a very white part of Idaho, I was like, I need to get out of here. I need to find my people. Um, and so a lot of my training was centered around, to the degree that I, that I focused on critical race studies, was focused around Asian American, uh, Asian Asian American studies, and um, then I finished my PhD and I needed a job. <laughs> and uh, the job that I found was teaching English at Northwest Indian College, and so I studied the history of and literature of science as, as uh, you know, like uh, as a graduate student. And my focus was largely on how some of the Renaissance European British greats like Shakespeare uh, took up all of these stories about, um, uh, about how we know what we know and why we believe it and how they, they kind of wove that into what would become the foundation for modern science. Which is to say, I wasn't just a Shakespeare scholar, but I was kind of a Shakespeare scholar. So I found myself like on the Nez Perce reservation my very first day, like I literally like filed my PhD like the day that I needed to file it to begin teaching the next day, like as a newly minted Shakespeare scholar, being like, who wants to talk about Shakespeare? Like no one, no one, no one here wants to talk about Shakespeare. Um, and I had this sort of eye-opening revelation that was long overdue as to how the things that I found so essential and so interesting um, about how the foundations of modern science itself were so profoundly, I don't know what to say, but so profoundly racist and so manufactured in the sort of like, what it has like, seemed like the sort of piddling and inconsequential um, maneuverings of, of British royal politics and how science itself is something that we really should examine as a racist propaganda machine. Um, and I know some people say this from the perspective of 
critical theory and a lifetime in the humanities. I say this from the perspective of someone who has been a practicing scientist for many years. I was just like, what do I do with the fact that like, I think everything I believe, I suddenly want to throw out the window and I like want to also jump out of my skin and jump out of this classroom because a whole bunch of people are staring at me as if I'm like <laughs> uh, some sort of very offensive outsider. Um, so for me, that job involved so much humility and so much learning um, in terms of like how I was going to take everything that I had learned about ecology and everything I had learned about um, literature and was going to sort of remake that understanding within this sort of like growing awareness of what the knowledge that I had given my life to, um, the, the violence that it had brought upon entire cultures. Um, one of the weird things about that job was, is in a very remote community, a chemistry professor quit. And so the director of the college kid me, was like, can you teach organic chemistry just once? And I was like, I took it in college and it was terrifying. Uh, I guess I'll do that because students needed it to graduate. It was kind of sketchy, but I was like, I, I know organic chemistry, I can do this. Um, and this sort of was the beginning of coming to understand how the kinds of storytelling that we perform in the humanities are so profoundly related to the way that we can learn and communicate and even produce knowledge in, this, in the sciences. So I ended up teaching almost entirely science classes there um, because my students Dr. Liu, you're muted. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I, I can you hear me again? Some some I blanked yeah. out there. Um, I think one of the sort of relics of the sort of colonial violence that the education system has like wrought upon a lot of tribes is with this sort of allergy to textbooks, right? Like textbooks were um, a colonial way of imposing white knowledge upon indigenous communities and no one would learn from them. No one would open their chemistry textbooks. Um, I actually had a few like literally thrown at me and I had to think about like how else how else can we sort of approach this knowledge? How can I shed everything that I thought I knew and, um, and, and teach what it is that my students want to learn? Um, so what I ended up doing was working with uh, some tribal scientists who were involved in the Nez Perce tribes um, sovereignty project. And part of that was energy sovereignty. So they were uh, growing canola and producing biodiesel. And I was like, oh, I know that. That's a saponification reaction. I learned that in organic chemistry because we ran that reaction to make soap. It was very exciting. <laughs> we like package it up, we bring it home, we've got our soap. I was like, but the other product of that reaction should be biodiesel. And I'm pretty sure we can learn the same process, but redirect it towards like, what is the instrumental knowledge that you can gain from these systems, or you can appropriate from these systems that are sort of rooted in white supremacy, that you can learn and turn towards indigenous priorities, right? And so starting with that, like how do I make biodiesel? How do I let my students test their biodiesel without burning down the chemistry lab? We almost, we, <laughs> we had a few small fires along the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it really just became a process in learning everything I thought I knew all over again through a different lens. Um, I ended up uh, going to work for tribal fisheries because I was like, I, you know, this is a targeted education. My students wanted to be natural resource professionals and I had to think to myself, well, how can I prepare them for this? Like I'm a Shakespeare scholar. I took like <laughs> pre-medical uh, biology classes, right? Like what? Um, uh, so I ended up going to work in the very field uh, for the very people that my students would be working for. Um, absolutely fell in love with it to the point that when I moved here to Seattle and began working at Pierce, I also started um, studying again at the University of Washington with the explicit goal of, you know, how can I be a decolonial anti-racist educator and how can I continue to learn uh, both about environmental science and about the ways in which 
that field itself needs to be decolonized. Um, I find I often end up in disputes with, <laughs> uh, with uh, my environmental science peers um, because those two worlds are just, I mean, they're worlds apart, right? Like everything that we discuss in the context of anti-racist education, you know, you walk into an ecology classroom in a sort of mainstream environmental science program and and you get the opposite. And I, I don't mean that as a criticism of the University of Washington. I think they try very, very hard to um, combat that trend, but it is absolutely endemic. So I guess uh, my point here is I see um, the settler colonial legacy as something that extends back hundreds of years into history, but is also something that we reify or we recreate every day, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's something that still exists when you walk into the classroom. So I don't quite know how you combat that, but I think it's really important that when we tell these stories, they're not stories that we tell about the past. They're stories that we tell about what happens uh, when you, you know, walk into a class every day. Like what happens when you read books right now? Um, what happens when you try to tell your own stories and feel like the containers for your stories aren't the ones that fit what you actually have to say? Thank you for that. Thank you for doing such a good job with my rambling and nonsensical question. I really appreciate that. And also, I just want to say that we value and prize your interdisciplinary approach, and it fits right in with the kind of pedagogy that we do here at Evergreen Tacoma. So it is really nice to hear the ways in which you connect so many things. I'm now going to go to Horacio who has a question or comment. Horacio, go ahead and come on the mic and um, speak directly to Dr. Liu. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody, Dr. Liu. Um, thank you for your presentation today. Um, there were so many things that you hit on that, uh, that kind of just are in like, I don't know, my, my mental ether um, each day, uh, especially when I walk into the forest. Um, I don't know where to start. Um, I'm thinking so much about like the, pro like the, the way that you use poetry or the way that poetry and like, and how you weave that into like the natural world and like give it another look or like another perspective. Um, I, I took a class at UW with um, a doctor by the name of Michelle Montgomery. Um, and we started to read books by, um, by Robin Kimmerer. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember one of the, one of the chapters it was talking about, like t she was showing some ecology students like into, into, uh, into a forest and like they were able to like, they were able to name like, oh, that's this, that's the other, you know, like this is good for this or like this does this or, you know, and it, and it, and it kind of resembled like going into a warehouse and like just being able to name, to name all the things off the shelf. Um, There's very little connection to what was actually going on. Um, very little personal relationship. Um, and I think up until like, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I, I really started to like ask myself, like m my parents are also immigrants and, 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 I and I would ask myself, I'd be like, well, like, what is it to mean to belong here? Like I was born here. Um, and every time that I, that I go to the forest, like, am I, am I causing destruction or am I like, am, am I, am I in, in, in infringing on like that purity, right? Like am I, are my footsteps um, into this natural world like uh, causing damage? Um, and and I, you know, like it, it took time, but like thinking about like notions of purity, thinking about like, I don't know, thinking about like, you you know, you are meant to be here. You can, you can step here. Um, and so my questions started to become like, they started to expand a little bit. And, and I started to ask myself like, am I, Am I scotch broom, you know, like am, am I am I scotch broom or am I am I mushrooms? Um, am I parasitic or am I symbiotic? You know, and and you know, like it, it you go in there and and, and <laughs> depending how you feel and um sometimes you feel like a certain way and sometimes you feel another way, but um 
yeah uh I, yeah i just really want to thank you because this is this is this has really just been on my mind so much um especially with like yeah wanting to go into the, to this field but but also like challenging like my own um patriarchy like my own internalized like white supremacy um yeah just bringing in bringing in like like uh whenever i go into the forest with some of my my friends um and 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 i and i look at the trees and and like it's raining and and, and i and i say to my friend like the, the trees know how to rain dance and and then you know like my, my friend he's like he's a, he's a white dude but um He's just like, oh well, it's because transpiration, you know. He just, he just really starts to like get into it, um, and and little by little, like I know, like we'll be able to talk to each other, right? Little by little, like we'll be able to like find a way where it's like, oh, like I'm not feeling this way, or you're not feeling this way, right? Like it's 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 not me just being superstitious or me being romantic, or it's not him just being like hard-minded or like completely mental. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, all of that really resonates with me. And I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to have this conversation. Um, not to sound like a total creeper, but I wasn't able to attend the immigration panel because actually um, uh, my daughter was just born two weeks ago. So I had told Anthony, I'm going, it sounds so exciting. And then I was like, I have like a <laughs> brand new baby. What was I thinking? Like, there's no way that I'm, <laughs> that I'm like going to like zoom into a panel. Um, but Anthony, uh, shared uh, the recordings with me and so actually you know I, I watched them as soon as I could and I was uh, uh, just really struck by how what you had to say about the sort of dissonance that you feel even with the terms that we have to describe like our own cultural identities um, you know how much that idea has in common with the sort of ecological lexicons that I've been grappling with here um, so yeah, I think we're very much on the same wavelength with this and that you're perhaps more capable than I am of, of beginning to sort of, um, I guess, broaden the net here and talk about how these sort of linguistic challenges get to the root of like <laughs> who we are and the language that we have uh, to talk about ourselves. Um, yeah, so um, Anecdotally, my, my daughter's name is Juniper. Um, and part of why my daughter's name is Juniper is because like when I was an undergraduate, like my, my undergraduate thesis was about the interactions between juniper trees and a species of uh, mistletoe, which just uh, parasitizes and destroys mistletoe under certain conditions. And the question was, um, okay, so how do, mistletoe, how do junipers defend themselves against against mistletoe and uh, what does that look like from the perspective of plant physiology? Um, how do, so like uh, this, this Fordendron densum, it's a partially heterotrophic species of mistletoe that basically what it does is it has a really high rate of transpiration. So it taps, it's a xylem tapping plant that like taps into the, the juniper's uh, xylem. And then it basically, um, evaporates really, really, really rapidly with the idea that it's going to concentrate all of the sort of dilute nutrients in the xylem um, into uh, dense enough nutrients that can actually sustain the plant. But of course, this involves an immense amount of water loss. And superficially speaking, it's really, really bad for the juniper trees, right? So my question was like, huh, this seems like it's bad for the junipers, but does this end up being a good thing? Like, is this a shedding mechanism where basically the way that the junipers eventually get rid of the mistletoe is that they become so desiccated that the mistletoe can no longer live through that mechanism. So the mistletoe die and fall off and the juniper has been severely compromised, but is it able to recover once it's been able to lose enough water that it eventually destroys the parasite, right? Um, so the reason I'm telling you this story is because it of course is one that is laden with metaphor, right? Um, I really fell in love with the plants in the process of this and you know the process of getting to spend like five years like out um, in the high desert in Southern California where the juniper pinion woodlands like um, meet like you know the sort of Joshua tree plains. Um, so yeah, I named my daughter Juniper. We have this tradition on the Chinese side of my family where our, um, the grandpa names the grandkids. 
which is awkward for me because my Chinese is so terrible that I can fairly say the name that my grandfather gave me, let alone um, the names that my father has chosen for my kids. Um, but my granddaughter, I am so embarrassed because I'm only just learning how to say these words. Um, <laughs> but her Chinese name is uh, Song Shi, uh, which is like a, a, he intended as a description of the juniper tree. So it's like a durable or resilient or evergreen. Um, and I don't think he even, he knows, he's a scientist, he knows approximately what my research was, right? Um, and I begged him to choose something I could pronounce and he was like, nope, sorry, like this is what it's going to be because this is the meaning behind the name. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just saying like, I'm absolutely, I think on the same page with you about um, the way that our sort of stories about plants are sort of spiritual connections with them, but also the way that the spiritual connections and the metaphors around them tie into the actual science as well. Um, yeah, all of these kind of like swirl together and interact in ways that I find to be both, well, both is the wrong word because I'm gonna say more than two things, um, I guess sort of challenging and sacred and sometimes embarrassing all at once, right? Um, so yeah. I guess I'll leave it at that. I just uh, was really struck by the things that you you said in the in the, in the previous forum. Uh, like really um, grateful for your contributions today, and I think these are really 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 important conversations to keep having. Um, they're ones that are often kind of shoved to the sidelines of environmental science conversation. And I'm so glad that you mentioned Kimmerer's book because I think it is just such a wonderful example of the ways in which we can sort of begin to start challenging some of those disciplinary norms. Thank you for that. And, and first, let me congratulate you on the birth of Juniper and welcome her to the world and give her a Sankofa greeting. Um, thank you so much. I'm so happy about um, the new life that is in your life. That is beautiful. Um, also, I wanted to say to, Horas to Horacio, muchísimas gracias por tus palabras tu corazón y tu alma. And I'm telling him, thank you for your words, your heart and your soul. Um, I, I, we have two more questions. Um, so I'm gonna read a student question that I got in the chat. I'm then gonna go to Dina Arunga with a question and then we'll move on to give back. So folks start thinking about your give backs. Gee, I got you in line for the give back. You'll be first in that line. The student asks, uh, one student wonders if you are familiar with the large tradition of indigenous environmentalism, and if you've been exposed to their ideas of humans as part of the ecosystem rather than separate from it. I also wonder if you'd be willing to talk about what you think about the idea of invasive species as a human invention through our kind of forced migration of animal importation and allowing animals that would usually not be migratory to make such huge jumps in ecosystem. That notion of ecological imperialism that we associate with Alfred Crosby, but was discussed early on by native peoples themselves. And I'll put that, that question in the chat as well so that you can see it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for those questions. I think they're remarkable questions that um, are close to my heart uh, that I do try to grapple with without satisfactory answers, which means my responses are probably long and rambling. Um, but I would say that I do my very best to familiarize myself with sort of indigenous relationships to nature. Um, and I work closely, um, you know, for, for many years with the Nez Perce tribe and now with, with Klamath Basin tribes to kind of create scientific paradigms that incorporate these indigenous values and indigenous priorities. Um, I think one of the challenges when it comes to talking about these traditions from my own non-indigenous personnel, uh, uh, my own non-indigenous um, positionality, um, which I hope I've kind of expressed as sort of tend to feel sort of at least doubly displaced from the land, right? Um, which makes me realize my own foreignness, perhaps with a greater degree of self-consciousness than many white settler scientists are uh, likely to feel. I don't want to 
appropriate those stories. I think they're beautiful stories. I think they're compelling stories. Um, I think they offer an alternate understanding of nature that in many ways is sort of more accurate and more integrated into the landscape itself than anything that Western science has ever been able to approach. Um, I think I just grapple with those barriers still where it's like, yes, like, you know, I, I read Kimmerer all day or Daniel Wildcat or, um, you know, I think there's so many um, local, local legends and so many tribal elders with sort of indigenous knowledge that um, never sees the sort of public light of day. Um, those are some of the voices in my ears when I talk about my own, my own experience of nature as an immigrant, uh, as a settler, as someone who feels like I don't belong on these landscapes. It's always against the foil of um, what it would mean to belong to the landscape, to manage the landscape in ways that came from a perspective of being one with nature. Um, that's another sort of insoluble problem as far as I'm concerned. Like how do we do justice to those indigenous perspectives without appropriating them? Um, as far as I've been able to reckon, I think the answer is to sort of amplify and prioritize uh, sort of those voices um, while also recognizing the ways in which my own perspective kind of leaves those, I guess, in a way sort of off limits to, to my own accounting for, for nature in my life. Um, the second question is a really, really, really big question. Um, I think the first thing that popped into my head, um, I don't know, it's, gosh, it's kind of, I don't know where 20 years went, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, John McPhee published an absolute a geological tome uh, called The Annals of the Former World. And one of the anecdotes in that book, which is kind of a geological cross-section of America, is talking about the, uh, the sort of slow spread of asters sort of westward across America out of uh, their sort of original range. And the way that as they moved across the great Buffalo Plains, they um, were carried by stock in their manure into um, or sort of out of out of their sort of uh, historical range and into soil that was high in selenium. And the asters like took up the selenium and this plant that was whatever, like a fine, I mean, just a, a you know, sort of ubiquitous uh, plant in the, in the East Coast actually ended up becoming um, poison as it moved out of its terrain, right? Because it was taking up selenium, then other, I mean, both like stock animals or like wild animals would eat uh, these poisonous flowers. And so they were just, um, I mean, destroyed by this, right? Um, so I think stories like this sort of create such problems because they tell like very scientifically real stories about the dangers of invasiveness, right? You pop a plant down where it doesn't belong. It has, it's removed from its historical and ecological context. And we don't know what the results of that transplantation are going to be. And there are some cases where those results have been catastrophic. There are many results where it's been a nuisance, right? Especially when we um, intentionally transplant um, species, thinking that as humans, we understand what they're going to do and we have control of that. Like a really great example here would be the story of tamarisk in the West, right? So we go and we're like, oh, like the West is dry, we need to irrigate it. We try to take control of the um, Colorado River, build all of these like irrigation routes and waterways and immediately have a huge erosion problem, right? So we bring in this plant, um, it's called salt cedar, right? And uh, we like plant it along the edges of all of these rivers because it's going to grow really rapidly. It's going to prevent erosion. It's going to be like this engineering masterpiece. Um, I, if any of you know the sort of history of tamarisk in the West, it was not an engineering masterpiece. It was a really fatal mistake um, because this was an incredibly invasive plant uh, that uh, just sort of uh, uh, transported itself up and down these waterways uh, with the seeds carried by the water and by all of the traffic along, uh, along these uh, routes. Um, 
like the mistletoe I described earlier, it's a species of plant that was capable of really rapid evapotranspiration. Um, the mistletoe used this to concentrate nutrients. Uh, I guess tamarisk does as well, but one of the other things that it did was concentrated salt, right? So there was actually a section on tamarisk in the original draft of this essay. And then the editors of High Country News were like, this is way too long and rambling, this has to go. And I was like, no, but this is essential because it's kind of the complicating piece about how and where those narratives arose and how they do have some sort of level of biological validity that really sort of sets my heart up for a war, right? Um, because tamarisk should not have been introduced into the West. It's my strong opinion that that was a mistake, right? Um, because it takes up all of the salt uh, when the tamarisk dies, or when the tamarisk does this, nothing else can grow there except for more tamarisk, right? It's like the literal salted earth. Um, I it destroys riparian zones. It destroys the vegetation that grows along rivers. Like uh, we did this through an act of human hubris thinking that we could engineer the West. Um, and I mean, we still can't eradicate it. <laughs> I don't know how many millions of dollars go to work crews just trying to like pry up all the tamarisk that has taken root throughout the West. Um, I say this story with the sort of hyper consciousness of my <laughs> own cultural past and the idea that we imported, not only did we import slaves, we imported Chinese workers to build the railroads. We imported Chinese workers uh, to mine for gold and silver. Um, the sort of same ideology that led us to import Tamarisk as a worker, led us to import and enslave people as workers. And now here we are trying to poison Tamarisk and rip it out of the West. Right, so what's the analogy when it comes to my own existence here? I don't want to be poisoned and ripped out of the area that I uh, grew up thinking I belonged in, right? So how do those stories twine together? How can we disentangle them? Um, and how can we sort of tell stories about nativeness um, that do less harm to human communities while also somehow navigating those sort of complex ecological wounds where you know, I do have to say like, oof, right? Like in the, in the example in the article, it's like, yeah, it is probably true that brook trout are destroying bull trout. It is probably true that tamarisk should not have been introduced. It is probably true. See, it could, the litany goes on and on and on, right? How do we square those things with each other? Um, I think part of the great reckoning, this is perhaps a very nihilistic answer here, um, Climate change is the great reckoning. And that's part of why I have been so interested in sort of expanding my sort of education to sort of understand this set of issues. Um, we've lived for generations in a world where the earth and its ecosystems were solid beneath our feet and people were moving around and people like myself moved into landscapes where we were strangers. Um, but climate change is shifting the ecological communities beneath our feet, it's shifting the weather, it's shifting the water, it's shifting the snowpack, it's shifting, it's shifting everything. So I think all of us are going to become increasingly sort of strangers in the land that we called home or maybe our parents or our parents' parents called home. Um, and so with that, I think we're really going to have to shift our conversation about what it means to be invasive. Um, natural, well, anthropogenic human caused changes in the weather are now going to trigger, are already triggering uh, shifts in species composition. What do we do with that? Is that, are those exotic species because humans cause it or are those native species shifting their um, distributions in response to <laughs> what humans have done to the climate, right? And we also are looking at mass human migrations, even within the United States itself, we're looking at people shifting, like there's all of these people, they make their entire lives out of predicting which people are going to move from which parts of the country to other parts of the country, in addition to immigration across borders. Um, America, Northern America, the, the Northern part of North America is gonna become prime real estate. And we're gonna be dealing with some very different um, uh, immigration issues in the decade in the decades to come. So I think all of those really dramatically complicate what it means to be an invasive species, human or otherwise. 
Thank you for that. I'm going to now turn to Dr. Arunga for a question. It's our final question. We're running a little bit short of time. So I want to be sure that Dr. Arunga has a chance to ask your question, ask you a question, you answer quickly. Then we'll do a quick give back. We'll do five people in the give back. Um, I've got one, two lined up, three more gives back, give backs, and then we'll, um, we'll uh, take a break. So Dr. Arunga, please go ahead. First, I need to just say thank you, Dr. Liu. It's been a wonderful um, uh, journey with you just to hear you speak and also to think about your own life and how it intersects with this subject of science, of how the ecology of things and in your own life. I, I really appreciate that you brought your own story to the table. And I want to ask you about those dual identities as both settler and um, as uh, immigrant and inside of your own identity, what ways might that uh, have an influence on the way you might build a bridge toward the future, how we see ourselves going, um, even in terms of the uh, ecological framework, where are we going and what, what wisdom do you have around that? I think about uh, your role as an ally with knowledge of both sides of those identities and then your knowledge that you're bringing into ecology as, a, as insight to how we might, uh, how do we move forward? How do we relate in the future? So if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, thank you so much for that question and for the opportunity to be here today. Um, it really has been an honor and a delight. Um, I think I would respond to your question by sort of bridging off of the last thing that I was saying about sort of the great reckoning that the climate change is posing for us. You know, I think sort of throughout, I guess, the history of American environmentalism, immigrants have been on the outside as if we have no skin in this game um, and no experience of what it means to be either indigenous or to be a settler who is sort of developing these new ways of sort of owning and relating to the land. Um, I think that's changing and I think it's gonna to continue to change. I think the otherness that immigrants feel in America and in American landscapes is increasingly going to set upon all of us as the landscapes change above our heads and under our feet and as people uh, become compelled to sort of vacate their historical homes and uh, you know migrate towards more um, climatically um, amenable areas right so i'm hoping and maybe it's wrong to sort of advocate patience here right the advocate the advocate activist part of me says says don't wait but part of me thinks that to some degree this change is going to come to us because the wisdom that immigrants have had all along is going to be something that um increasingly everyone needs so i think it's going to be a sort of balance between stepping in as um, an ally and as an accomplice, especially when we see the acts of aggression against scholars and researchers of color that seem to be particularly prevalent in the environmental sciences. So I think at a practical level, just sort of constant vigilance and sort of action. Um, and then at a more theoretical level, I think the world is going to come to us. That makes sense. Maybe that's optimistic, but but uh, that is you know a combination of my sort of uh, minoritized hope and my climate dread <laughs> is that uh, when it comes to the theory, the world's going to come to us. Thank you so much for that uh, response, and thank you, Dean Arunga, for your excellent question. I'm now going to turn it over to our community to offer give back, and Dr. Liu, give back in our tradition here at the. Um, Evergreen State College Tacoma campus is where our students offer you thanks and praise for the knowledge, information, wisdom, and experience that you've given us. We give back to you. This is a, a time where you can um, mute and sit back and um, bathe in the praises of the community. I've got G up first, then I've got Genevieve. I'm looking for a couple more folks to come in and offer a give back right to me directly. G, I'm going to turn it over to you. Come on to the mic and offer your give back. Thank you, G. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, I really appreciate being able to hear from you. 
today. I mean, it was real, real, real interesting, very interesting. And just, you know, oh, good words towards you. Thank you for coming to the community today. You know, like I said, I really appreciated everything you said. I was, you know, kind of like a roller coaster ride, you know, because it was just so much information. You're, you're full of life, more than qualified to, to share with anybody, an educator from the heart, I can tell. But one of the things I really appreciated was how you're intertwined, um, so to speak, the human community and the uh, ecological community, how you just kind of bridge that together. And I felt that not in just your Dr. Jennifer Liu professional words, but your words when it came to your parents, the words when it came to your daughter. Um, you spoke eloquently, it's beautiful. And just from me to you, you're always, always qualified to speak. You have a voice. I heard it. Take it from me. I've been around. I know what it's like when you feel, I should, should I be here? Should I? You was meant to be here. You're supposed to be here. You know, the words you're sharing with us today are words. I, I belong to the best learning community in the country. Yeah, I said it. I said it. And today you were blessed to be a part of that and share it with us. I know you see my chocolate complexion. There's been plenty of times where I felt out of place back in the day. And then I met online uh, Dr. Lee, Professor Bacho, Dr. Tateranga, mm -hmm. Dr. Zaragoza, mm -hmm. my Auntie Shepherd. And I feel like I belong to a house. You belong to this house if no other house. And, and I'm qualified to say that even though I'm not on the payroll. Ain't that great? We love you. Thank you so much for sharing. I learned something today. I learned something today. Not just about me. I learned something about my sister, Dr. Lou. Take care. Thank you, G. We're going to go to Genevieve next. Genevieve, you can come on the mic and uh, offer your give back. Thank you, Genevieve. Hello. Um yeah, I wanted to thank you for a really um, informative talk. Um, environmentalism is a huge passion of mine, um, nature, obviously. Um, and yeah, it's just really great to hear your perspective um, and from such a lens that pulls from all of these different aspects of life that we're studying as well. Um, especially thinking about the migration um, is kind of our focus. And so, um, yeah, it's really important to hear all the stories um, including yours. And yeah, I definitely related it to my own family as well. Um, and yeah, I just um, have a lot to think about. And we, yeah, agree with G that you are now part of all of our, you know, framework, all of our mental ether, as Horacio said. So um, thank you for coming and appreciate your time. Thank you, Genevieve. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna go to our final give back on behalf of the faculty, Dr. Mingxia Li will offer the give back. Hey, uh, Dr. Liu, thank you for coming to our community and share your training, your uh, stories, and how you're still in the process of evolving uh, into some uh, anti, what's the word, Un uh, decolonialized anti-racist educator. So we learn plenty from you. And thank you very much for your thoughtful comments and the way you demonstrate um, the complexity of the human, and the ecological system by offer so many different perspectives uh, in your narrative, in your analysis, uh, in your self-identity. So that is probably one way we can looking at uh, a, a symbiotic relationships with uh, different manifestations in a long uh, line a time, long timeline of evolution, right? So that's one of the things we are learning uh, through your talk and contemplating all these important elements you bring out to our community. Um, I think as a faculty body, we learned um, how to um, 
open up rather than lecturing, open up for questioning uh, is one way of, of, of uh, um, guiding ourselves and our learning community to continue exploration and cultivating lifelong learners. Thank you very much for spending your time and thoughts with us today. Thank you, Dr. Z, for inviting such intriguing uh, speakers and discover uh, Dr. Lu. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And it was really um, Dr. Julie White, um, president of Pierce College, who suggested Dr. Liu to me um, as a speaker. And I am so glad that Dr. White made that suggestion and that we've made this connection and I hope this connection continues to grow. So Dr. Liu, thank you again for being with us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, knowledge, experience and stories. I hope that we can continue to build um, our connection to you and Pierce Community College. Thank you so much for being with us.